There's no doubt that the Big Bang Theory reigns supreme in its ability to explain the universe. All the evidence that we have in front of us points to a universe that used to be really, really small and really, really hot, and now is much bigger and much colder. That's the basic Big Bang picture. Uh, but in the 100 years since the development of the Big Bang Theory, uh, there have been a lot of contenders. It hasn't been the only contender on the block. So in today's video, I want to explore five alternatives to the Big Bang Theory that just didn't work out. Starting with number five, the eternal universe. Yep. So prior to the Big Bang Theory, uh, we, we had assumed, and we being scientists, philosophers, you know, uh, people who thought about cosmology, that the universe was just the, the universe, that the same universe you have today is the same universe that you had yesterday, the same universe you had a, a thousand years ago, and the same universe you'll have a thousand years in the future. It's pretty much the same. Yeah, things might change here and there. You know, life on Earth is kind of messy. There's a workstation. Sometimes stars explode, etc., etc. But on the big scale, the universe is simply the universe. This all changed with Edwin Hubble's uh, 1920s observation that the universe is expanding, that our universe is getting bigger, that galaxies are moving away from each other. This directly contradicts the concept of an eternal universe because if we live in an expanding universe, and we do, then that means in the past our universe was smaller and in the future the universe will be bigger. And just that, just that right there tells us that the universe is changing, it's dynamic, it's evolving. The universe is not some big constant. The universe is different with time. It changes with time. It evolves with time. And so whatever cosmology you want to have, however you want to explain this result, it needs to incorporate the idea that our universe changes with time. This flies directly in the face of previous cosmologies that had assumed the universe was just the way it was. Well, well, too bad, it's expanding. Number four, steady state cosmology. Now, when Hubble made his observation and, and we realized that every galaxy is moving away from every other galaxy, there was an attempt to uh, rescue some version of the eternal universe. And this is called the steady state model uh, developed by astronomer Fred Hoyle, who is not the biggest fan of Big Bang cosmology. In fact, he's the one who named Big Bang cosmology the Big Bang in a somewhat derogatory way. Like, oh yeah, there just someday there was some Big Bang, whoop-de-doo. Yep. In the Big Bang model, there is a beginning to the universe. There is a point when the universe was, well, a, a, a point, a, a tiny, infinitely tiny point. And, and then things happened after that that we call the Big Bang, and all the galaxies are moving away from each other. Uh, Fred Hoyle and astronomers who were fans of the steady state model uh, disagreed with this idea. They, they didn't like the idea of the universe having a starting point or a creation point, uh, but they couldn't get around the fact that, yes, galaxies are getting further away from each other. So the counter to the Big Bang Theory is that instead of there being some initial point and then everything gets bigger and all the galaxies get further away, uh, yes, the galaxies are getting further away from each other, but there's always a new fresh supply of matter uh, percolating throughout the universe to keep everything the same. So yes, I see all these galaxies moving away from me, but then there's new stuff constantly created or, or constantly appearing to replace those galaxies. And so, yes, th this reconciles the observations that galaxies are getting further away from each other, but pulls in an, an idea from the eternal universe that, oh, no, 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 yeah, yeah, it's getting bigger, but it's always get been getting bigger. And our universe is not changing with time over long time scales. There's just always fonts of new matter, and then the galaxies get further away, and that simply is the way it is. The steady state theory's downfall 
There's two observations. One is quasars. These are high energy, super duper bright radio sources that only appear in the distant universe. We don't find quasars close to us. We only find the quasars far away. In the Big Bang Theory, this is no big deal because the further you go out in space, the further back in time you are looking. And so, yeah, you're just seeing a younger universe and the universe when it was younger was smaller, things were different. So you can have quasars that are playing around in the early universe and then the universe evolves and now there are no more quasars. That's super easy for the Big Bang Theory, but for steady state that's hard because the distant universe should look exactly the same as the nearby universe if everything is always the same throughout time, which is not. The second observation was, of course, the cosmic microwave background, the light from the early universe. In Big Bang Theory, again, it's no big deal. In fact, this was a prediction of the Big Bang Theory that there should be this leftover light. Steady state, not so much. So sorry, Fred, you really tried. Number three, the electric universe. It's electric. Even after the demise of the steady state theory in the 1940s and 50s, uh, there was one idea that never really caught on, uh, but was heavily um, promoted by uh, physicist Hans Alphen. Now Hans Alphen was a genius, super smart dude, and developed single-handedly an entire field of physics called magnetohydrodynamics, which that is a wonderful word. Uh, this is the physics of highly charged, highly magnetized plasmas. He figured out the mathematics, he figured out the governing equations, and he was able to apply this to a lot of systems. And of course, you know, won the Nobel Prize for it. You know, super smart, like I said. Now, Hans really, really loved electric and magnetic fields. I mean, why not? He got a Nobel Prize for it. So he tended to apply these ideas of electric and magnetic fields uh, being very important to, to just about every single problem in the universe. His basic argument was that gravity is super weak. And you're right, gravity is indeed super weak. It's by far the weakest of the forces. And electricity and magnetism are super strong compared to gravity. So why should we care about gravity, this is, this is his argument, when we could care about electricity and magnetism? They're so much stronger, they're so much more influential. So he applied, uh, ideas related to electricity and magnetism to explain uh, the appearance of asteroids, the formation of the solar system, and cosmology its, itself. He said, look, at the very biggest scales, gravity's super weak. Who cares about gravity? Instead, it's electricity and magnetism. So in his model, called the electric universe model or plasma cosmology model, there, the universe is divided into these giant domains of matter and antimatter, and they rub up against each other. And because of all the uh, electrostatic forces, it's causing each of these bubbles to expand and that's how you get an expansion of the universe. And then where places where these regions meet, uh, they generate some sparks, they generate some high energy stuff, and then this is the quasars. <sighs> Once again, uh, great idea, out of the box thinking. We always applaud that and celebrate that in science and physics, uh, but it's also wrong because ultimately you have to answer to the evidence. Science is a liar sometimes. And the evidence in this case has to do with the expansion of the universe. Uh, in the electric universe model, uh, every galaxy just receded away from every other galaxy. This expansion was uniform. But that's not quite what we see. We see something called Hubble's Law, where if you take two galaxies and they're separated by a certain distance, they'll recede away from each other at a certain speed. And then if you double that distance, the recession speed is doubled. And if you quadruple it, the speed is quadrupled. There's a relationship between the speed that we see the galaxies flying away from us and their distance from us. This is perfectly natural in a Big Bang Theory in an expanding universe because there's more space, so there's more expansion, so it's all proportional. Uh, you don't get Hubble's Law in an electric universe. 
It just violates observations. Uh, plus, it's like super hard to get the cosmic microwave background in an electric universe. Uh, and also, if you're trying to use the friction between these domains to explain the quasars, well, we know what the quasars are now because we have better observations of them. They're very, very bright radio loud galaxies. They're not points of friction between two domains. So, uh, and also if you want friction or, or like these interactions at the domain regions to generate quasars, you're also gonna generate things like, I don't know, like super high energy radiation, which should be pouring in from the outer edges of the universe, and it's not. So once again, electric universe, not a bad idea, Electricity and magnetism are very strong, but you know what? At the very largest scales, our universe is overall neutral. There are just as many negative charges as, as there are positive charges. So all the electricity and magnetism stuff cancels out at very large scales. The only thing left is gravity. Number two, the Mixmaster universe. Uh, uh, back in the 70s, we were trying to understand uh, so one particular aspect of the Big Bang Theory. Every theory, every model has, um, you know, isn't 100% complete. There are always mysteries, there are always cracks, there are always gaps in any model of the universe. This, that's, that's just science, and that's not unique to the Big Bang Theory. And one curious thing about the Big Bang Theory that we weren't able to understand is uh, something called the horizon problem. We live in an obviously mixed up universe. There are galaxies over here and then big patches of nothing over there. That's pretty cool. There was something that made the universe a uh, lumpy like this. But then when I look at the very, very largest scales and I look over here and I say, measure the average temperature over here, and then I look on the complete opposite end of the universe and measure the average temperature over here, they're pretty much the same. There hasn't been enough time in the history of our universe, in the vanilla standard Big Bang model, to make this patch of the universe have roughly the same temperature as this patch of the universe, while simultaneously mixing things up to make it, to make it lumpy and give us galaxies. You, it seems you can't have both. This is called the horizon problem, and general relativist Charles Misner proposed the Mixmaster solution. He, he thought that maybe in the incredibly early universe, the expansion of our universe was not uniform like this. Uh, maybe it like restart, maybe it got all janky, maybe parts of it started vibrating over here and then a part vibrated over here and like just the universe got all slushy. And yes, Mixmaster, Mix Master, the name comes from the brand of, of kitchen blenders. So he thought all this vibration did two things. Mixed up the universe so that you can have some lumpy bits like galaxies, and mixed it up at large scales so that everything was even as the initial moments of expansion were occurring. It turns out this didn't quite work because uh, the mathematics couldn't give you the right mix. It couldn't give you both small scale lumps and large scale smoothness. Uh, wasn't actually able to accomplish that. And then we developed inflation theory, which said that the early universe was very, very small and very uniform. Then inflation drove everything apart and then decayed so that you have the smoothness at large scales uh, and then inflation fell apart and, and made microscopic fluctuations be normal size. I, I did a whole video on inflation. I, I won't dig into it. The main point is a better idea came along that did fit the evidence, was able to work, while Mixmaster, as awesome as that name is, just, just didn't work out. And lastly, number one, cyclic universes. One of the biggest problems people have with the Big Bang Theory, uh, one of the deepest like philosophical or, or gut reactions is that, yeah, the Big Bang Theory says the universe had a beginning. There was a time where there was no universe, and then there was a time where there was a universe, and that seems weird. You know, that seems tough. You want to explain that origin. And we know our theories break down in the earliest moments of the universe. And so we're hoping that we can replace the beginning of the universe with something else, with some physics, with some new knowledge that we, instead of just saying like, well, then the universe began and the Big Bang happened. We want to replace that with something. But if you replace that with a one-off event, 
Like, oh, no, 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 it's not the Big Bang. There was this process that happened before it, uh, and it was only one, it was the only one of its kind, and then that led into, into the Big Bang. You haven't made a lot of progress. You've just shifted the, the origins of the universe back in time and in, haven't really solved much. You're a slacker. When theorists try to explain the origins of the universe, they usually end up coming up with some version of a repeating universe. That way, the uniqueness, the singularity of the Big Bang itself is replaced with something that's always been there and always continues to happen. If, if this is smelling like the revenge of the eternal universe, you are correct. This is still trying a hundred years later to uh, unseat the Big Bang Theory from its throne and replace it with something that looks eternal. Replace it, our universe and our cosmology, with something that has always been here. Uh, I don't know why, but it, there's a big drive to do this, like a desire to get rid of that singularity point and replace it with something that's always been here. There are many, many, many cyclic cosmology models out there. Perhaps the most famous in the public imagination is Roger Penrose's Conformal Cyclic Cosmology, CCC. It's very popular in the public imagination because Roger Penrose, super famous physicist and mathematician, went Nobel Prize winner, uh, came up with the idea. And the basic idea says, hey, look, in our early universe, we were super boring. Before, you know, the growth of galaxies and all that, our universe was super boring. Didn't have much going on. And in the far future of our universe, when with our accelerated expansion uh, and all matter getting driven apart from everything else, it's also going to be super boring. So, hey, isn't that funny? Super boring beginning, super boring end, maybe there's a connection. Maybe in the far, far, far future of our universe, when our universe is so thinned out it's basically empty, that becomes a new Big Bang because it looks pretty much the same. Interesting idea. There is no math to back it up. Um, I've been emphasizing that this idea is popular in the public imagination. It's not so popular in the physics imagination uh, in the scientific community because there's like no technical paper. Roger Penrose came up with this idea in a book. Sounds interesting, sounds cool, but that's not how physics works. You need some math to back it up. We need to figure out how this would actually work. And there is, there is no technical stuff. There's no journal article paper that, that fleshes out what this theory actually means and how it operates and, and, and how physics would happen in this universe. Uh, so there isn't much to, to critique from a scientific point of view because there isn't a lot of science behind it. And, and, but there are some objections you can make. Um, in order for the conformal cyclic cosmology to work, there has to be, in the far distant future, no matter, anywhere. No protons, no electrons, no neutrinos, nothing. You need a completely empty universe. If there's even one speck of matter, then the universe is too interesting and you can't make the connection to the very early universe. So this relies on all matter eventually dissolving and decaying into radiation and then the radiation cooling to nearly absolute zero in order for this to work. And that's not guaranteed to work. And that's a problem with the other cyclic cosmologies out there that rely on things like string theory, is that these rely on very, very uh, hypothetical theoretical ideas that are not grounded in, in our current knowledge of the universe. They might be right, they might be right, I'll go ahead and say it. But right now, they're so speculative that we can't even tell if they're right or not. We have no, we don't even know if we could perform experiments to test it because the mathematics just hasn't been worked out. So could we be living in a cyclic universe, a series of big bangs that keep happening and happening throughout eternity? Maybe. Would we ever be able to tell the difference between a cyclic cosmology and one that's just normal big bang? Maybe. I do know that all cyclic cosmologies, with the exception of Roger Penrose's idea, uh, have a lot of trouble with dark energy. This is the accelerated expansion of the universe, and it's really, really, really hard to have a universe that repeats itself when all we see around us is accelerated expansion that will never end. Will dark energy change in the future? Maybe, we have no idea what dark energy is, so all that is with all the caveats, but I'm gonna go ahead and say cyclic cosmologies are failed because they haven't even gotten started. 
We haven't even gone down the road of a fully fleshed out cyclic model universe that matches all known observations. As far as we can tell, the Big Bang is here to stay. Thank you so much for watching. Please go to patreon.com slash pmsutter. That is the best way to support this show and all my outreach work. I really do appreciate it, and I'll see you next time.